And uh, Michael, if you're if you're if you can hear me, maybe we can um, take down the uh, image so we can have our. There we go. Perfect. Um, and I'll just say a brief word of welcome and introduction to our panelists for this discussion. Uh, I am Kyle Roberts. I'm the academic dean of United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. I'm very glad that uh, you've enjoyed the and joined this important conversation, which I believe you will enjoy. I believe it'll be fascinating and energizing and uh, will be the first of what I hope will be many such interreligious conversations hosted jointly by both United Theological Seminary and the Islamic Seminary of America. A brief word about our partnership. Um, United and the Islamic Seminary of America have begun, have begun a partnership on a degree program in interreligious chaplaincy, one of very few partnerships like this between Christian and Muslim seminaries. The program offers courses in interreligious chaplaincy, pastoral and spiritual care from interreligious and intercultural standpoints, and core courses in Islamic religious texts and tradition interpretation, as well as courses in leadership, ethics, and so forth. We're able to do this by partnering and offering courses both through United and through TISA, the Islamic Seminary of America. So now let me present the participants for today's discussion on a book that um, has recently come out and uh, I'll let uh, Justin say more about that in a moment. Uh, three of the participants today are contributing authors to the book. Um, Mordecai Schreiber, Schreiber is an American reform rabbi and author of about 60 books, born in Haifa, Israel in 1939. Um, he has told about his experience seeing the state of Israel being born in his memoir, Land of Dreams, as well as in his recent book, Three Founders of Israel, uh, Ben-Gurion, Begin and Stern. He has served as a rabbi in the United States and Guatemala. He's assisted the US government as an expert during trials of several former Nazis who settled in the US. He's the founder of the Agnon School in Cleveland, Ohio, which has been renamed the Mandel School. Uh, so look forward to hearing from him, as well as Iqbal Unis, who's focused his professional career on the evolving Muslim presence in America, gaining distinctive insight into its growth. He's associated with the International Institute of Islamic Thought and has served as Secretary General of the Islamic Society of North America, where he's currently on a member of the board. Dr. Yunus has published several articles, a book chapter, two children's books, as well as the abridged Apostasy in Islam, an historical and scriptural analysis, and has edited Muslim American Life, Reflections and Perspectives. Uh, Dr. Ian Punnett is ordained to the Holy Order of the Diaconate in the Episcopal Church in America and is Professor of Mass Communication and Journalism at Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. He's the author of How to Pray When You're Pissed at God and Toward a Theory of True Crime Narratives. These will be our uh, con contributing author uh, uh, panelists for this conversation today and then I'm also excited to introduce you to Dr. Justin Sabia Tanis, who is Assistant Professor and Director of the Social Transformation Program at United Theological Seminary. As a pastor, he served congregations in Boston, Honolulu, and San Francisco, and was Director of the Leadership Development for Metropolitan Community Churches. He's now with the United Church of Christ. In his prior work, he served as Managing Director of the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies and Religion, and has directed communications for the Hawaii Equal Rights Marriage Project of the National Center for Transgender Equality and Out and Equal Workplace Advocates. Uh, Justin has taught at several schools and seminaries and now with United. Uh, Justin, I will now hand it over to you to tell us a little bit about the book and lead us into this discussion. Thank you so much, Kyle. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, and I'm so excited about this book because I really enjoyed reading it, and I'm, I'm very excited to have this conversation with you all today. Um, I was asked to sort of share a little summary since folks who are attending may or may not have read the book yet, but I highly encourage you to do so. Um, but I wanted to start with a couple, couple of quotes from the, from the book from near the beginning. Uh, the book says, it, so, the, so the book is talking about uh, a, um, a Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian share leadership lessons from the life of Moses. Um, and on page 13, they say, ultimately is a simple story of an inspired person 
who challenged injustice and cruelty and led the oppressed to freedom. Perhaps with nothing more than the belief that things can get better and sheer determination to be the change agent that is going to make it happen. For millions of Jews, Christians, and Muslims, Moses represents humanity at its best and the belief that anyone, anybody can perform miracles if they walk with God. And in the concluding chapter, it says the story of Moses in all the phases of his life, even in this brief discourse, offers Jews, Christians, and Muslims valuable lessons in purposeful, trustworthy leadership and the art of working together, especially in the time of tyrants. In these lessons, people of all faiths, and even none at all, discover the ancient and time-tested origins of president, present-day leadership, organizational behavior, and interpersonal communication. So and in between those, those uh, the beginning and the end, of course, you share moments of a story that walk us through how Moses first became, uh, entered into the palace of Pharaoh and then ultimately became a, then became a shepherd. And it was really those moments with the sheep, I think mean, one of your wonderful insights, these moments as a shepherd that made Moses, uh, gave him the start as a humble, effective leader that he became. Um, it takes us through his confrontations with Pharaoh, but most importantly, his guiding of the Israelites and his own growth, like taking input from others and sharing leadership. And you intersperse this with stories of modern people in the workplace um, and how these leadership lessons apply to us as modern people, uh, these ancient stories. Um, you know, and Moses was not a, as you point out, was not a gifted speaker or a renowned leader. He's not, doesn't begin from a position of, of power. Rather, he begins from a place of, of curiosity um, and faithfulness and um, humility. People of all ages and humble outlook can become leaders and servants of God and of the people. Uh, and you point out how God calls people uh, at different stages of their life. Not only Moses, but Jesus and Muhammad as well, and drawing from those traditions. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping we'll get into a little of, uh, to have a chance to talk about some of those lessons that you share in between. Um, but again, this the this book traces the traces the life of Moses, uh, particularly, uh, uh, and uh, shares how that how that could uh, could teach us something about what do we do with the world around us today. Um, so I want to start by asking you about uh, one of the really wonderful things about this book for me uh, is its exemplary interreligious scholarship. So you weave together three different traditions in ways that I think uh, illuminates stories so much more than if we just told the story from one perspective. Uh, each tradition adds some details to the others. Um, and so by adding these, these uh, perspectives, we get a much richer view of Moses and the events of the Exodus. So I wonder if you could start a little by talking about um, what that process of weaving together these different traditions was, how that worked for you, um, and uh, what does it mean for you to work interreligiously? Why is that a value uh, to the three of you as authors? Well, let me, uh, let me first say you read that beautifully. If we ever do this as like a book on tape, man, you're our number one candidate for that. Um, and my impression as you read it was, dang, that was good. We wrote that? And, and I think that's part of the joy of this experience for all of us. Um, I think I can speak for my co-authors too on this, is that this was not a negotiation. There was never a time when we were really deeply involved in any type of conflict. There are some interesting moments of differentiation, which is good. It added to the energy and the chemistry of the book. But this was not... Like, okay, we'll do this one over here for the Jewish reader. Oh, we'll do this over here for the Muslim reader. And we got to say this for the Christians. It, it really was never that. It was so effortless. And I would say, at least in the way in which my tradition, my Reformed tradition looks at it, it really felt like um, it was the still small voice of God, the Holy Spirit, from the beginning that was pulling us in this direction. And as somebody once described to me, that's a little bit like falling back into an updraft and just letting something be carried as opposed to managing it or trying to make something out of it. Um, and that's what it was for me. Uh, it, it was just a jet stream that took the book from the original concept, which came from Dr. Eunice, uh, to its completion. So. 
since originally this whole idea was Dr. Eunice's, uh, I'll turn to him and say, was, it, was this what you were hoping for when you, when you started this whole thing? Got to go on mute. That's, uh, there you go. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, the, the somebody somebody has to do that in every Zoom, but like, <laughs> at least one time. So you're in, you're in good shape. I want to make sure there was no external interference. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that's an important point that uh, we didn't have to negotiate or we didn't have to contradict one another. We didn't have to quarrel over items. And I think uh, to me, uh, the reason for that is that we are focused on the basic lessons, the fundamental lessons of the story. And the details can vary sometimes and they do vary and between the, uh, the Jewish understanding and the biblical understanding and the Quranic understanding of the story. There are occasions where there are differences, but then we need to keep in mind what is, what is the message, what is the central message, what is the lesson that comes from it, because that is important. And so while we, and, and the book notes that, you know, the Quran says this and the Bible says this and so on and so forth, but you'll see that the, the, the central message and the underlying theme uh, remains the same, and I think that is very satisfying. Uh, I might just add quickly as to the, because you, you refer to the origin of the book. I mean, from uh, my way of thinking, the two, two ideas that are related came to my mind. One is that I find that sometimes people who have a lot of experience and skill set and so on in the line of work are not able to use the same outside their narrow line of work. When they come, come to a church setting, for example, they come to faith gathering, they come to social you know, uh, occasions or social gatherings, uh, nonprofit work, they seem to check out their skills at the door, you know, and then say, you know, what should I do? And, and that is very important because that is a dichotomy in people's mind, as if their particular skills are only set for a particular purpose and not for developing the whole person. And so I thought, that maybe if we can somehow convince people that even the contemporary understanding of major issues, of how to do things, how to lead, how to manage and so on, is rooted in their faith. And once they see that these things are rooted in their faith, then they give, give more value to it and they become part of the being. And then they can't say, well, I learned this at work, but I don't know how to use it in the church, for example. So mm -hmm. that kind of removes the dichotomy by, by grounding their understanding in their faith helps that. And that's where uh, Moses comes in, you know, because as we have noted in the book, everything we talk about in modern times actually is rooted in what Moses practiced and, and taught. I, I don't know if that helps or not, but... Uh, I thought that was good to share. Helps me. I want to go back and put that in the book now. I want to go <laughs> we have a second edition. Yeah, really. Rabbi? Yeah, um, of course, I have a lifetime of interacting with Moses, if only for the simple reason that once a year at Passover, you know, it's uh, the Moses story. But, and I've always known that Moses is important to the other two major Abrahamic religions. But it's not until now, at this late time in my own life, that I was so fortunate to come upon the, the full meaning of Moses for all three. And, and I found that this, is, this can be an, an incredible uh, asset to the, for the human race at this point in time, which is a very trying, very difficult point. And the more I've been delving into this, we've been in this project now for a couple of years, put a lot of time into it and still are promoting it. Um, more and more, I get the feeling that there are many, many people around the world right now that feel that there's something coming. Mm -hmm. There is something major, major coming. And nobody knows exactly what it is. But I, fortunately for me, and I, and I, imag and I imagine for the other two authors as well, um, we have our compass. Moses is, is a compass that brings together 
Jesus, Muhammad, Baula, uh, all the array of uh, monotheistic uh, prophets, teachers. And, and this is extremely, extremely important because we humans have been very good at fighting each other, discriminating against each other, making a mess out of the world. That, that's been our specialty. You know, in, in, in the Hebrew Bible, there's an expression, the time of the coming of the kings. That's springtime. Why is springtime the time of the coming of the kings? Because that's when they went to war. Hmm. The weather got nice, hmm. they could get out of their shells, and they went to fight each other. Hmm. This was a, the basis of human civilization. Well, heck, I think somehow that, if that has got to start changing. You know, uh, and, and, and this, is, this is what this book has given me personally, this realization and this awakening that there's, something is coming and uh, we, we may have a hand in it. So I think one of the things that's important, one, one of the things that's important in the book is that you talk about um, uh, this is as a stance that Moses' stance against tyranny and oppression, you know, and we live at a time when we're rightly very concerned, as, as you say, Rabbi Shriver, about, um, about the forces of the, of the world, about uh, the rising populism. Um, and I, I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about the, um, you know, some of the specific lessons, I think, from, from Moses um, and the ways you approach that. How, how, how does this story help us? understand how to how to stand up to tyranny um, well first of all I think it's Pharaoh important and, yeah go ahead <laughs> I think it's important to point out that when the uh, Israelites come out of Egyptian slavery across the Red Sea the Bible emphasizes it wasn't just the children of, of Israel Jacob it was an Arab Rav it was a uh, cross-section of oppressed people, probably from Africa, from other places, who were all enslaved in Egypt at the time, because you know, the Egyptian had this huge construction projects. You needed thousands of laborers to build those pyramids, and then, uh, et cetera. So, so immediately it's a universal story. It's not just a story of a small people in a little corner of the Middle East. It's a universal story from the beginning. And moreover, what makes it such an incredible story, it's not just we got out, now, you know, uh, have a good time, have a, have a good life. No. They go up to Mount Sinai. They get the law, which becomes the, the law for uh, the cornerstone of, of human ethics, you, you know, the Ten Commandments. And then, if this, as if this wasn't enough, they take a step further over those 40 years, and they get to the promised land. And the promised land is such a powerful uh, symbol of, of human aspiration and human fulfillment. Something that speaks to African Americans, that speaks to the whole human race, because we're all looking for our promised land, whatever it may be. So you have here a sort of a paradigm, which is, um, I think, uh, if I may say so, unsurpassed. Whether you are a believer, you're not a believer, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a human story. And it should resonate with every person who cares about what's going on. Yeah, uh, let me add to that too, that I think um, part of the success of the book is to recognize that pharaohs come in many forms. And it's often the petty office tyrant that the average reader will encounter. Um, and how do you survive that? What, what is the leadership lesson from Moses that is applicable uh, to somebody who is abusing the power that they have of your employment um, and then can just make you so miserable that it's hard even to imagine a promised land could even exist for you or that you might feel a kind of mental slavery to this uh, person who can be so controlling and and uh, uh, and it requires a, the the right kind of subversion 
And I think this is what the, the book also speaks to. It's not just about standing up to the uh, autocrats that are in the world that are driving human history right now. But it's to that person in the, you know, in the, in the office at the end of the cubicle farm. Um, and they, they are the ones that you, you are unprepared to handle. And th this book arms people, I think, with the notion of being able to stand up against tyrants and how to do it within your own heart. And it, it really starts internally. Absolutely. A little point that, uh, not a little one, but just a small core area of this is that, uh, at least in the Quranic version, and as you know, Moses' story is repeated many times in the Quran. Uh, one thing that I, I, I pick up is that God is telling the Israelites that he has favored them. He has given them, you know, things. Of course, he's saved them, Pharaoh and so on, and all the story of manna and, and all, all little and big stories. But then he, the, the idea seems to be that, okay, if you're favored, you have to return that favor in, the, in that case through by obedience to God's commandments and kindness to people. So the, this idea of somebody being favored has to return that favor in some way is very important. Uh, one cannot uh, expect to uh, be favored with either wealth or prestige or position and then think that he is God in a sense, that he has to return that favor by being kind by being obedient to higher authority, by you know returning it in some way, I, I, you know that that I think also is a, a lesson that comes to. Uh, if I can add something to that too, I think two points are important. That you mentioned Justin in the introduction that Moses, um, you know, came from the palace, and but when he rose to the figure and to the leadership level that we speak of in the book that's when he understood what power was. Before that, like a lot of people, they were confusing privilege with power. And privilege allowed Moses to avoid power. Privilege allowed Moses to avoid an understanding of his role in the society into which he had been born and then elevated uh, by, by becoming a part of this palace. And I think this conversation, even what Dr. Yunus just said, where he, he talks about the Quranic perspective on the Israelites will come as a very refreshing and perhaps surprising understanding for, um, for Christians who are unfamiliar with the Quranic text and might not have supposed that the Quran is as respectful uh, to the story of the Israelites as it is. Um, and that the, the parallel between the, the, the Hebrew Bible and its version of that narrative and the Quranic narrative, it's very close, but it's, there's no uh, condemnation, there's no pejorative terminology used in the Quran in discussing the Israelites. And just as Dr. Yunus was saying, it, it was they, they enjoyed a favored status with God. And that is reflected in the Quran. And I think that is part of the beauty of the book is people will have a new understanding of just how cohesive these two wonderful books are and these three wonderful traditions built around them uh, can be. Yeah, I will say I did, I did not realize those, the texts were as close as they were until I, until I read this book. And it was really fascinating. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, why it was important to write this book for millennials. Um, since I, since as we, talk, we talked uh, in preparation for this, clearly there are leadership lessons here for people of, of all ages. Right. Um, and he was, uh, uh, you know, I'm in the Gen Xer and, and so is Dr. Roberts and I uh, kept sending him uh, quotes from it as we were reading the book and discussing them of how they apply to our situation. So clearly they have lessons for of folks. Um, but it's really important to you to, to, to have this book address millennials. And I wonder if you could talk about what that, why that is. Well, as the uh, only member of the panel without any facial hair, let me... <laughs> I noticed Kyle from yesterday started growing a beard. 
just, <laughs> just to fit in. And he knowing full well that I can't, I think he's, it was a very, it's very passive aggressive how he did that. Uh, you know, what I love about that concept was that we, we recognize that there are so many people who are, who would love to know that there were models of cooperation and cohesion um, like Moses centuries ago, and that it's part of religious traditions and that religions don't have to divide us. And millennials are very sensitive, appropriately so, thankfully, on the idea of the process of enjoyment, of, 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 of a satisfying work experience or home life or communities. And I think that's what resonated as we were rereading the story of Moses from that perspective is that one could argue that at least in literature, he, he may be the first millennial. Um, in the, if we look at the concept of maybe a little late to develop, um, you know, hung out at home a little long, which is what the knock on millennials was for a long time, uh, that Moses found his feet later on in life, but made the most of the opportunity by working together and creating a coalition and not deciding unilaterally, I alone can fix this. And that's, again, what drew us into that idea of millennial leadership. Um, and in a way, we were kind of predictive of the trouble that <laughs> President Trump was going to have in his reelection campaign in reaching out to millennials. And he did as one of the deciding cohorts um, in his uh, in his reelection loss was that they don't chime with the idea of that top down authoritarian you know uh, what we call the command and control style leadership within the office and I think that again came back to millennials need to know this story for a group that may be less likely to be members of churches the bookstore faithful um, that is a large piece of the millennial experience would um, would value this if we gave it to them in a form which they could uh, which they could understand not pretending to be millennials ourselves not you know in any way um, pandering to them which it, the book never does but we just sort of make the argument that the way you think it has been thought like that before when it came to leadership you know one interesting uh, way to look at it is is that um, others who are not millennials might say, well, what's in it? Why, why not for me? So they might be tempted to read it just because the name is not there. To see. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I wanted to share this interesting thing. One of my daughters sent an, uh, an image uh, of a t-shirt that says the two you know, the tablets, and it says, Moses was the first person with a tablet downloading data from the cloud. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. What we would call today an early adapter. <laughs> so, yeah. I'd like to add the millennials are the next generation that are going to uh, step into the leadership roles in the world. And so it's very important, you know, for, yeah. for the future that they, to draw their attention to the book. Uh, all dogs like us will appreciate it anyway, but, but they may uh, look askance at the book, but once you make it clear to them that it's really about them, that really they have the qualities that the world needs right now, that may be a motivator to say, hey, you know what, uh, maybe uh, I should take another look. Yeah, and uh, the, the subtext of that is we had a 77-year-old running against a 74-year-old for president. And neither of those groups represent um, the people that will be either benefiting or suffering from their decisions 15, 20 years from now, which is why younger leadership needs to take the reins and geezers like us need to let go of the wheel. Um, it's time. It's time to promote that millennial growth to say, okay, show us how you would do this because the way that you want to solve problems and the way you value community, the way you, you value um, everybody having a good piece of the process, this is where we need to go as a nation and as a, and as a world. And you can do this. You're already hardwired to do this. Now, here's our encouragement. Great. And 
I want to remind the people who are who are att attendees, you're welcome to put a question and answer a question in the Q and A. No, uh, please put the answer up too. That would be very helpful, I think, for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there were a couple of of, of uh, questions about what role millennials had in the book project, or or what kind of consultation was done. What kind of conversations did you have with folks who are millennials as you were working on this on this volume? Well, I'll, I'll speak first on that. I mean, certainly uh, my children who are both millennials, um, I was in, I've been engaged in these conversations for quite some time. And they're also not uh, traditional uh, churchgoers. They, are, they would consider themselves like many millennials to be spiritual, but not religious. Um, and so they kind of count on me in a way to provide that link to the ancient texts. They like that. They just don't necessarily want to do all the heavy lifting themselves. And so that's a conversation I've had with them. But then even along the way, every, um, every person at every publishing house has fallen within that millennial group that we have worked with. And that feedback has been helpful um, uh, in, as part of this uh, process. We didn't put it up to a focus group or anything I, I think would have been kind of cheesy. Uh, but um, we weren't trying to fake anything, and we. But Dr. Eunice, do you have a thought on that? Some of your kids are millennials, obviously. Yeah, I, I, I can too. Uh, like you said, we didn't have a, you know, uh, a particular set of interviews and so on and so forth. Uh, it was more observation, and observation uh, in, in my case came from two sources. One is, of course, uh, some of my children are millennials, so you observe how they think and behave and and uh, respond to different situations. And also uh, in the Islamic side of North America, where I'm a board member, uh, we have had this tension between some board members that are on the older generation and some that are millennials and, and they have been sort of, and you can see the, the way they think and the way they respond to crises and situations like that. We always, the older people are always falling back to their older experiences and trying to find something that they can put back on there. And the millennials are looking more, uh, more to their expectations of what it should be, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, you know, one, one thing I, I noticed in, in more than one case, that there are people that I know, younger people, who have given up you know, comfortable uh, jobs and, and, you know, uh, a lot of money and all that stuff in favor of doing something that is meaningful mm -hmm. and take different jobs in, yeah. in, in human services and nonprofit work and so on, where, uh, you know, it may not be as uh, sort of uh, comfortable, but it gives them a sense of accomplishing something instead of just filling somebody else's coffers. And I think that approach of doing something that is meaningful and purposeful uh, and, um, uh, and, and benefit somebody else <clears throat> is also the central theme of the Moses story. It is not for oneself, it's for other people. I have three children who are millennials. They're all very accomplished and very committed to uh, social action and bettering society. I even have a granddaughter who is the tail end of the millennial period, right. the very last year. And she's is also showing great promise. I can't help but feel that this is a very gifted generation. And they, they make me feel that we can look to the future with trust and with uh, great expectations. In spite of what the world looks like right now, which I don't know how we, we, we contributed or didn't contribute to any of this, I don't know. But I do know that I sleep well at night when I think about uh, my... Uh, offspring and uh, and their friends and, and their age group and I'm very proud of them. I think the one to sum that up Justin then is the title of the book and the thrust of the book is a call to millennials. It's not a book about them. It's it's a it's a it's a plea for their empowerment and to realize what is waiting for them. Uh, it, they just they need to step up and the party leaders, political party leaders need to step back and need to value that this contribution that they make as a, as a generation, you know, given the characteristics markers, you know, of, of this generation is just what we need, I think, at a time like this. 
Thank you. And I mean, I think I think that's exactly the point. When it, so there's another question that's asking essentially how do um, how do the other the boomer generation, the silent generation, how do folks how do we encourage folks to step back and and allow uh, allow millennials to to step into into that place. The question specifically about churches here, but I think it, I think it actually applies across the board to communities of faith. I agree. I agree. Uh, I'll just say, I, I think they just need to make their voices louder. It's not a matter of drowning out the older people, but it's also being heard. And I think that there's some vanity. Ecclesiastes addresses this, um, and perhaps the rabbi wants to chime in on this a little better, but I think that's another piece of, of an understanding of the role of, of the religious texts in this experience, Ecclesiastes recognized that older people have a way of building monuments to themselves, but in the end, it's, it's all vanity. Um, and uh, and the, the more we can call that out amongst, you know, the silent, the remaining silent generation people like, um, like president uh, elect Biden uh, or boomers like uh, uh, technically like uh, president Trump. Um, Maury, you have a thought on that? Well, um, I think that the, our present experience with the pandemic, to, to me and to many other people, sh has shown that how important it is to value everybody across the social um, strata, because everybody plays a very important role in all of our lives in any kind of uh, better than thou kind of an attitude right is is kind of productive and 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 uh, dead ended so i i think uh, there's a great awareness among a lot of people thinking people in particular that you know pay attention pay attention to everyone if i may if i may add there's a uh, it's in the book uh, uh, when Moses is uh, very busy uh, tending to the affairs of uh, uh, of the of the group, uh, and when Jethro comes and uh, then advises him uh, on how to not be consumed um, by deciding every matter himself, but have delegation and have appoint uh, people and so on. So you can read the story, but the basic idea is that Moses was not shy to take or accept wisdom from Jethro, who was older, of course. And so when we say millennial, it does not mean that they should complete, cut off their connection from the past. You know, human experience is a continuity. Uh, the idea is that the millennials have a certain way of looking at things and a certain uh, sense of direction. And whatever benefits from the past they pick up and what doesn't, they don't get tied to it. They are not, they're not ready to the past, and yet they need to benefit from the past. But it's still their sense of direction is, uh, comes from their inner, you know, inner self or the inner understanding of which way they're headed. I'd like to talk for a minute about that sense, about that sense of, from, of humanity. Um, you know, one of the things you talk about is, um, uh, on page 18, it says, prophets usually reflect God's optimism that given alternatives, human beings will choose the right path. And you describe Moses's story as the triumph of imagination over cynicism. Um, uh, and on page 81, you talk about uh, God always challenges humanity to be better towards one's tormentors than they deserve. You know, so there's a theme in this book, I think, of, that, that has a, a, ver a generosity about, about humanity and about how you approach the text that I, that I think is really interesting. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that sense of optimism shaped your, your reading of the story and your, how you see this as applying to, to leadership today. Because um, often folks are, are, there is a lot of cynicism and there is a lot of right. anxiety. And yet you take a very different approach and you read a very different approach in the, in the text here. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to leave that up to my uh, cohorts here while I pander to the Minnesota audience for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, uh, part of the re response to this question might be 
uh, how we look at our relationship with God or humanity's relationship with God. Uh, from the Islamic perspective, God is a God of mercy, of forgiveness. And it is always God is prodding us and encouraging us to be better. Uh, I, I, and the, when we fail to be better, then even then he is giving us excuses to, to either revert and, 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 and repent uh, and then move forward. Uh, but there is no, I did, at least I don't get the impression that God simply is just a God of punishment waiting for us to make a mistake so he can punish us. That is not the idea. The idea is that God created us uh, in the best of molds. Uh, one of the words in the Quran talks about that, God created in the best of molds. And then we fell down, except those who do good deeds and and you know follow guidance uh, from God. So there's always this sense that even when we make mistakes, there is a way that God shows us to uh, to to repent and to improve and to keep moving forward. Uh, one of the verses in the Quran says, "Never despair of the mercy of God. The mercy of God is always there as long as you know we we repent and we we are." Uh, we are moving ahead. Now, repentance doesn't mean that we repent and do the same bad thing again. I mean, that is not the idea. But we repent and correct ourselves, and then God moves us in the forward direction. Rabbi, Rabbi, I think that part of what the prophet was something very specific from one of our conversations. Is there more you want to say about that? The role of the prophet as as a as a sign of positivism? Well, Judaism is, is a prophetic religion. Uh, the Hebrew prophets uh, are really are the cornerstone of uh, the Jewish faith. Men like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and, and all the rest of them. Uh, they are the ones who, uh, you know, give us the, uh, the roadmap of life and it's, it's no accident that that tradition continued with those who transcended the small confines of the Jewish people who were always numerically small and still are and and then that that prophetic uh, message spread throughout the, the entire world and and it's uh, you know I've written several books about pro about the prophets and I've always felt that um, my life was always guided by their teachings. And it's not just said in a, you know, in a religious sense, it's said in a practical sense. Uh, I forget which prophet now said, God does not, to, to follow up on Dr. Runas, God said, uh, the prophet said, God does not wish the sinner to die, the evildoer to die. God wishes the evildoer to repent and return. The word in Hebrew for repentance is return. It's replying, answer, answering back to God's uh, plea. So the repentance is the cornerstone of the Jewish faith. And the most, the holiest day of the year for Jew, the day of atonement, is a day of repentance. Yep. We spend 24 hours once a year not eating, just praying and, and, and repenting. That, that, that is extremely, extremely important thing to understand. Could I jump in with a, uh, just um, looking at uh, Linda's question in the Q&A about how, um, how we move silence and boomer generation into a season of allowing new voices to be heard. And I'm wondering, not having read the book myself, uh, is, was there a lesson from the sort of transition of leadership from Moses uh, to Joshua or this idea that Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land? Is there some... Did you, did you work with that idea at all in terms of transitioning of um, generations? Rabbi? No, the, the book really ends with Moses, you know, not being allowed to enter the promised land and with the, uh, the wish, you know, that human, the human race will come together. We will find our promised land. Uh, you know, biblical history of leadership after Moses, beginning with Joshua, and particularly the kings, uh, is very uh, spotty. 
Unfortunately, uh, the Bible is a brutally honest book. It doesn't sugarcoat anything. And it reminds us that most of the kings of Israel and Judah were not good kings. <laughs> there were few shining stars, but there were many, you know, very mediocre or, or, or even worse. So, yeah, the, the, the Bible gives us a very honest picture of, of what took place during those centuries. And uh, we have to realize, like uh, uh, a niece of mine who was very smart said to me, many people think that human history is a linear progression. It's not. It's like the waves of the sea. They go out, they come back, they go back and forth. We go two steps forward, step backward. We see that all the time and we'll continue to see that. We only hope that the good will outweigh the bad. Yeah, we, we really wanted a cliffhanger. Uh, for the book. So the, yeah. who killed Moses pretty much right where it, <laughs> it ends. No, but I, I think, uh, I think Islam had a very informative understanding uh, of the death of Moses. We do discuss a transition in that sense that Moses knew early on, it was in the primary roles of a leader is that one should pick one's successor and that the, the, a good leader is always looking at the people they're going to bring up with them and not just, you know, when they leave the company or they die, everything's in disarray. It's not what a good leader wants. And, and so we understand why Moses couldn't see the promised land. But Dr. Yunus, do you wanna, do you wanna address real quickly the, the Muslim perspective on why Moses wasn't allowed to, to go to the promised land? I, I don't think there's a specific text that refers to that. Um, and the the uh, of course the biblical uh, version relates to the disobedience part of it and so on. Right. Um, but I think one one thing that the Quran does is keeps referring to Moses even when speaking to the Prophet Muhammad uh, and reminding him and reminding him of Moses and other prophets. So the Islamic concept of prophethood is that it's a it's a chain. It's not one single individual that, you know, where the chain breaks. We may see gaps, but those gaps don't mean that there was nothing. Uh, there was, there were things, there were, there were messengers and prophets and, and people uh, who were constantly bringing God's uh, uh, message or practicing it, uh, even though we may not know many of them. Uh, but guidance is a chain starting way back in the, uh, from the beginning to uh, and from the from the Muslim perspective until the Prophet Muhammad uh, peace be upon him. So I, I think the question of uh, uh, of uh, uh, Moses' death does not. I'm not sure if it's specifically addressed in that way, but it does give me the sense that it is not the person but the mission that was the key thing, and the mission is well described. You know. It's well described as to what he said, what he did, and all was focus was on the mission, on how uh, God was kind and, and merciful and, 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 and beneficent and so on and so forth. So the continuity of the mission, I think, is, is, is a stronger message than the continuity of the individuals. But I, I, I want to tease that out just a little bit, if I can, just to, to say that when Moses knew the ending was near, and I'm gonna be intentionally ironic and topical. He didn't pardon himself. And Moses, for all of his accomplishments, didn't pardon anybody. He too accepted responsibility for his shortcomings and didn't expect that he should be treated any differently for any failures he had in not being completely obedient, just as he was holding up others to the same standard. Um, I, I think that's a prescient message for the next few weeks, <laughs> perhaps. Well, you know, uh, uh, Moses was part of the desert generation that was born in slavery and, there, and therefore was not fit to enter the promised land. That's why they went in circles for 40 years. They could have gotten there much, much sooner, but they went around in the desert to, for time to pass. So if Moses would have been allowed into the promised land, he would have made an exception. He would have been privileged. And, and that was against. And in the Hebrew Bible, it says that, that when uh, 
the Israelites were dying of thirst in the desert. And um, God tells Moses, take your staff and hit this rock and water will come out. <laughs> and, 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 and instead of just doing what God asked him to do, he turned to those rebellious Israelites and said to them, what's wrong with you people? You expect me to get water out of this rock? You know already, God told me, yes. And by the way, Bedouins to this day in the desert know that there are water deposits inside rocks. You tap, if you hear a hollow sound in the rock, they can get water. It's not so supernatural. It's just like burning bush is not so supernatural. There are bushes in the desert that burn and are not consumed because they have layers of oil that preserve the inside of the plant. So, you know, in a broader perspective, yeah, he, uh, it was his time to go. It was time for the new generation to enter the promised land. I like uh, the desert generation. I wish I'd known that we would have called them Gen D <laughs> <laughs> through the whole book. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. Okay, ne ne next edition. Next edition. <laughs> I think I might also, also add here uh, uh, the, the time when uh, Moses comes back and find this calf being worshipped. And he's upset with uh, uh, with Harun, with Aaron, and uh, and the all story that everybody knows. But the key thing that that uh, uh, stands out to me is that when he asks for forgiveness from God, he does not ask for forgiveness for Aaron alone. He asks for forgiveness for himself and Aaron. In fact, first for himself, and that's a very important point because that shows that he knew that it is he was responsible. And he delegated to uh, Aaron, but responsibility was his, and that he did not hold himself above other people. He, he knew that he had, you know, whatever happened, happened because that he had a part of that failure. And so he asked for forgiveness himself first. And I think that's a very important point. Yeah. Yeah. And one, of the, one of the questions asked sort of about that style of Moses' leadership said, one of the lessons I think Moses teaches is in his arguing with God or even asking God to be more gentle or merciful. Moses is feisty and angsty, like me, a millennial, which the questioner says. Amen. What is the Amen. relationship? What is the relationship between the prophetic and and not only talking for God, but with to or back towards God? Well, the, the Hebrew prophets were, were not uh, you know goody two shoes. Yep. They were in your face. And, they, and, and in fact, there's a saying, I forget, one of the minor prophets says uh, that the, the, the prophet is really a, a crazy person. Meshuga he, Ishahuach. He, he's not a normal person. They were a very strange breed of people, very asocial, and they're not going by the book. And, uh, you know, uh, they did crazy stuff. But out of that craziness came uh, the voice of God. What we call the prophet spectrum. Yeah. And uh, I think what's interesting about that, too, is that the, the prophetic voice enters into the whirlwind, doesn't stand apart from it. And, and I think that that's how we should all um, look at our responsibility of joining the conversation. And if we do it, as I, as I was taught in seminary, and Kyle, you'll have to tell me whether this is part of the experience at UTS, too, but we were always taught that you enter into these conversations with God uh, humbly and open to correction, mm -hmm. but never, ever shy away from your opportunity to engage God and engage that, that the Holy Spirit when one has the opportunity. And it doesn't mean that you're going to hear a voice and you're going to say something and you're going to hear a voice. It just means that we know anybody who's been through that kind of experience knows that, you know, speaking truth to power comes with risks. And in a lot of ways, that's what Moses was always doing. He was speaking truth to power too, and uh, and and looked at that as the sacred responsibility that it is. Yeah. I think a, a, con a conversation with God is is the central part of all messages because that's what we are doing. Right. Even when you're praying, we're conversing with God, and if you're conversing, then probably the prayer doesn't have a whole lot of value because then we're just talking to ourselves right so uh, the conversation important part and uh, and we as we know from the Moses story also that uh, when God asked Moses to go to Pharaoh Moses was conversing with God then first asked well I have an impediment from my tongue 
you know, can you remove the impediment with my tongue? I, uh, my brother Aaron is, is a better speaker. Can you give him as my teammate? You know, and things like that. So I think conversation uh, is an important part of our relationship with God. If you're not conversing, uh, whether in big matters or even small matters, uh, there is no relationship. And I, I think actually too, and then again, that speaks to the imagination of God. And one of the things that we celebrate in this book is, you know, I love these moments where Moses is arguing with God about wanting to bring more people onto the team. And God's saying, I'm God. I'm like, it's you, all you need. And it's like, some point you gotta be like, all right, fine. You know, you can always hear God like, like a parent, like, all right, fine. I give in. All right, great, you get this. Now can we move forward? And I think the humanity of that is just so touching to me. It gives hope to all of us, I think. Apropos of uh, yeah. Moses, you know, we have two examples from recent history of very great leaders. Uh, Winston Churchill, after World War II, was not reelected. Right. The British people realized he was the greatest uh, war prime minister, maybe of all time. But once the war was over and they needed to, to rehabilitate uh, England, they turned to the Labour Party and the great man was sent home. We had the same thing happen in Israel with the founder of Israel, David Ben-Gurion. He was a great man, but he was also a very, very difficult man, very, you know, hard to take. And when a time came, the, the people told him, you know, your time is over. <laughs> We've got to move on. So this is nothing unusual in human history. Do we have time for another question, Kyle? Uh, yeah, we have a couple minutes left if there's one more Great. question. Great. Um, so someone who used to be, do admissions at United, uh, Glenn, uh, says he was impressed by the commitment millennials had to justice, to community, to care for each other right. in creation, but they did not necessarily find that in the traditional faith communities. Where are right. they those commitments now and in the future. And I might append to that, maybe you also reflect about are there ways in which faith communities could respond to the, either to millennials or to the material that you have in ways that might, might shift that. But, uh, but if they're not finding, if they're not finding places to live out their, their faith or faithing as you, as you put in the book, you know, where are they living out those commitments? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, the traditional Christian church often settles for image over substance. And uh, that's wrong, plain and simple. I'd rather do a bunch of things right and have nobody know about it uh, than make a big deal out of a few things or, or to follow the same old patterns. I mean, how many, we elevate <clears throat> even the mission trip or fun things to do for the congregation, which are valuable, not to be easily dismissed, but are, is that always our primary mission? Is our primary mission making a difference in the lives that are, of people who are suffering? And I think that that's something, unfortunately, that we abdicate. Uh, the church, uh, Inc., has abdicated um, over the centuries to government systems. And I think that's one of the reasons why people lose faith in, in the very people that profess it. Uh, is that they they go well? There's a you know there's a there's a government agency that handles that. We're the people who do this other thing, and I, I think sometimes it's a back to basics approach. Would is just what the millennials speak to, which is no, we'll just do it. We'll do it ourselves. We we can do this. We can we can make a difference, and and we can support ourselves at the same time. The company can make a profit and make a difference uh, in a way that's a lot less um, you know corporate and a lot less uh, PR minded as previous generations. That's probably a great place to end. So I wanna thank you all for all the panelists and authors for contributing to this discussion and Justin for moderating um, and the attendees for giving us your time and questions. I uh, found it to be a really rewarding time. Hope you did as well. So yeah, thank you. I'm, all. A, I'm a little scared by what Rabbi's saying about something coming. <laughs> I, I got to say, that's resonating with me. I, 
I was yeah. hoping that something coming was like going to be like jetpacks, but no, I think this sounds not nearly as fun. Well, it's uh, it's from the from the musical uh, West Side Story. Something coming, something good. I think something good is coming. Good. Well, then maybe it's jetpacks. So maybe. <laughs> God willing, yes. <laughs> We end on a hopeful note, at least. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank you. Well, thank you for hosting us. God bless. Take care.